What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here with another GSD Mode podcast interview, the number one podcast in the industry for real estate agents to learn how to get shit done. Make sure to check us out at www.gsdmode.com to check out other GSD Mode podcast interviews and other additional free content, free webinar trainings, and more epic content that I'm always putting out there to help real estate agents like you crush your real estate goals. Just a few quick plugs before we begin. If you are a driven real estate agent that has big goals, big dreams, and want to create greatness, then check out my personal mentorship coaching program at www.90daymastery.com where you can see how it works, what you can expect, see a ton of testimonials about the massive success other realtors just like yourself have experienced with the program, and learn why thousands and thousands of real estate agents have decided to join my personal coaching program to help them change their business and life forever. All right, so is real estate agents, hands down, by far, the number one most important tool in our real estate business is our CRM. If you want to use the exact same website and CRM I use that provides you with all my personal follow-up drips that allows my team to generate thousands of leads each and every month and close two-plus homes every single day, check us out at www.perfectstormnow.com to see the best, most effective, and affordable website CRM system on the planet. If you are going to sign up, make sure to go to perfectstormgsd.com. You want to make sure that you go there to register, perfectstormgsd.com, where you can get the registration free waived and only pay $199 a month. Uh, One last quick thing, your support truly means a lot. If you find these interviews and any other GSD mode content powerful, please make sure to share it with anyone that you feel can benefit from this content. All right, it is time to jump on into today's GSD mode podcast interview. What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here with another GSD Mode podcast where every single week we interview top real estate agents, top entrepreneurs, and straight up top badasses. They're out there dominating their space. And these are people that are choosing to not live a life of mediocrity, but instead to go out there and create big, amazing, epic lives for themselves, for their families, as well as have a big impact on others. And today, you guys, got another rock star guest on the show. Um, dude, I'm really excited to, to um, uh, really learn from, and I think all of us can learn a ton from, uh, uh, you know, we, we get so much and gain so much information on uh, um, um, how to go out there and, you know, generate leads, but leads themselves are irrelevant. Like nobody's got a lead generation issue. Uh, um, the issue becomes the lead conversion issue, right? Uh, um, the ability yeah. to go out there and set more appointments and what we do with those leads that, that truly matters and makes a difference. Uh, and, and there's just not a lot of great information or the information that we need to go out there and execute on. And our guest today, guys, is is one of the best and the best on the planet at this. And, and we're going to be able to go deep and teach you guys how to go out there and set more appointments and, and be more effective. So hopefully you can, you know, I mean, you, you master appointment setting, you're able to spend less money, get a higher ROI, work less, and go out there and make a shit ton more money. So um, um, our guest today, you guys, is the owner of Smart Inside Sales, uh, uh, which is a coaching and training company for residential real estate agents. Um, and before that, he was actually the director of lead generation for a top, uh, one of the top Keller Williams, uh, uh, Keller Williams real estate uh, uh, teams on the planet. Um, and he took them while he was involved with that company. Uh, before he started in that, that uh, department, they're doing roughly $100 million a year. During his time there, over doubled their business, over $200 million a year in production. Um, also a best-selling author and, and uh, much more. So really stoked and honored to have our guest, Dale Arch, back on the show. Come show, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me, man. I really appreciate it. You guys got an awesome show here and it's an honor to come and chat with you today. Yeah, no, it truly means a lot, man. I'm, I'm excited to have you on, man. It's, uh, um, um, you know, becoming a real estate agent myself, you know, and and growing my business, you know, I quickly realized that the, I mean, there's a lot of great things that we need to be, be brilliant at in our business. Like we got to go out there and of course, you know, be a great real estate agent for our clients. You know, yeah. put their needs above our commission checks and do what's right for them and really know how to, 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 to take care of them through the process, right? And that's just kind of like the ante that to, to be in this industry, right? Um, however, yeah. I know a bunch of great, amazing realtors that are broke as hell. Yeah, yeah. right? Um, you know, then from there, it's like, okay, once I got that in a place, I quickly realized that, man, if you can learn how to, how to not just lead gym, but, but, but uh, convert those leads, 
you know, not only do you solve your own problems and, and create anything that you want to create, you solve everybody else's problems. And, and it seems like it's the biggest thing that, that agents struggle with. And dude, you're on social media and Facebook. Yeah. Right? Everybody's like, oh man, I want more leads, want more leads. Everybody's so focused on leads. <laughs> Nobody's really focused probably... on what really matters of, yeah. and like, what, what are you doing with them? Like leads yeah, are important exactly. for sure, but if you cannot convert those, it's irrelevant. Yeah, right? Yeah. It just doesn't get talked about. And, and you being an expert in doing this, and, and what I like about you too, um, and I'm going to shut up and just start letting you talk, um, um, you know, is I like doers, man. And when we started this podcast, I'm like, look, there, there's so much smoke and mirrors in our business and in our industry. And, and, you know, most of the biggest influencers and coaches and, you know, whatever, they, they have done it. You know, they, they, yeah. they either have, 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 have did it 30 years ago, which is not relevant at all to, to the consumer today and how real estate is done today. Um, or they've never done it. Yeah, you know, right. They never um, got in the ring. You know, and I'm not saying that, that information uh, uh, still can't be bad information, right? Sometimes it can be, um, but it's 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 also very scary. It's very reckless. They can't speak to the same uh, uh, you know pains, problems, and so sort of this podcast. I'm like, look, man, we're only interviewing the doers, like people that have of 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 you know done it, built it, created it, had massive success, that have proven it in their world. So there is no theory. Yeah, right. Yeah. And you're a guy that this isn't theory, man. Like you, no. yeah, right. You grew a, a, a real estate company. You know, um, um, I mean, over a hundred million dollars in production in a year, which you know what, less than like a tenth of one percent of realtors even do a hundred million a year. Yeah, right. Yeah. So um, obviously, you know what the hell you're talking about, right? So, um, and you're now also proving it daily with your own clients. So before we get into all that, because I, I want to talk very heavily about what we can be doing as agents to to maximize this. Um, um, especially with consumers just being so flooded and sold all day long. Um, yeah. I'm really intrigued to learn more about um, your journey that, that, you know, just, just how this started, man. Like, like what led you to get into real estate? Um, um, and then what was that, that journey like that led you to, to being on the team and eventually led you to start your own company? Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, one of the funny things I like to talk about is my history. Um, even when I was in high school working part time, you know, talking about doers, man, I one a part time job I had in high school was in a one of those sweatshops in a call center in Kansas, in the middle of Kansas, selling credit card insurance to complete strangers over the phone. And I had, you know, back then I'm in high school, I don't know anything. I'm like trying to sell this credit card insurance to little old ladies at home. And it's a totally worthless product, but I actually did pretty well at it. I did so well that I got graduated up to doing Time Magazine renewals, which was totally easy because anybody who had a Time Magazine subscription wanted to keep going with it, right? Um, and back then I just thought it was a totally shitty dead end job that was never going to go anywhere. Let, you know, and I had no idea that like fast forward 20 years or more than I didn't do the math there, but much more later in my career, my life, I would actually come back around and, and need to use that and be a salesperson. I had never thought I was going to be a salesperson. I was just doing it for the money. Um, I even, I mean, I bartended through uh, college, but when I got out of college, I actually went to school for design. I didn't do anything around real estate. I didn't do anything in, in, in any of that uh, arena, right? I was still trying to figure out what I was going to do. I worked as a designer. The problem was I was on salary, right? And what I didn't realize at first when I got the job, but I figured it out doing it, is that the only reward for hard work in that, you know, nine to five position was more hard work. It didn't come with any more dollars attached to it, right? They just wanted me to do more work and put in more hours and take on more, more responsibility. And I had always been interested in real estate. Um, when my wife and I got married, actually, we bought our first investment property. It was a huge mistake. I actually went and I went and I talked to like a, a lifelong contractor, personal friend of mine. I was like, Hey man, come take a look at this building. Tell me what you think about it. He's like, I wouldn't buy it. I'm like, thanks for the advice, man. I'm, I'll figure out what I'm going to do. Totally didn't listen to him. Bought it anyway. It ended up being a money pit. But, and uh, so funny story about that is I was on my honeymoon with my wife. We actually bought it and settled on it. I think a week before we went on our honeymoon, huge mistake. Again, so I'm in Spain and I get like a call from one of these new tenants. I had never been a landlord before. I had no idea what I was doing. I get a call from one of the tenants that the hot water is out. And then she goes into the basement and says, the water is dumping out into the basement right now. I was like, Jesus Christ. So now I got like a busted water heater. I don't know anybody. And I'm in Spain on vacation. Uh, so long story short, that's, I just, I really liked real estate. I was always interested in it. So I'm in this career. I'm not getting any money. I'm, you know, I'm just making peanuts and they got me working all the time. And I was, and this was the time when the market was really hot. Basically anybody could sell. Everybody was a real estate agent. 
anybody could sell real estate and anybody could get money. All you had to do was ask for it and promise to give it back, right? That's basically what it took. So I was like, you know what? Screw this job. I'm just going to go into real estate. I'm going to work part time. I'm going to make a ton of money and I can just invest in real estate. and It'll be beautiful. So I get in, I start trying to figure things out. And even then it was still kind of hard getting started in the game, even though it was at the height of the market. Then the market crashed, right? And I, I don't know, were you, you were in the business back then, right? You were- 2005 is when I got in, so yeah. Yeah, you were in the business then. So I don't know how hard it hit you, but you're, out, you're in Arizona, right? Or Utah? Yeah, we're in the mecca of it, man. I mean, we still uh, haven't recovered. Yeah, you know, we're still 30% below peak value, peak 2005 prices. So you were at the tip of the now melted iceberg and, yeah. and you're still there. Okay, yeah. got it. So you know what we're talking about. And that's when I got into it. And I was like- uh, you know, how am I going to get business, man? How am I going to pay the bills? Like, how am I going to make this happen when like the world is on fire and everything's collapsing? And so I just went back to like, listen, all I know is that if I talk to people and I talk to enough people and I call them, I'm going to make appointments and I'm going to make business happen. And that's what I did. So I tapped into my call center training, got on the phone and just started calling people and setting appointments and, and getting business. Um, you know, it, and at the time, uh, I, then went and found Mike Ferry coaching at the time. And I just, I went to Mike Ferry coaching, man. And I was like, tell me what to do. And they said, call a billion people. Don't take no for an answer. Sit on their couch until they sign. That's what you do. I was like, okay, I'll do that. So followed it. And, and then I, you know, I got some success. I generated business. I was doing pretty good. And then at the time that I joined, what happened was I had a small team, you know, I was doing pretty good. It was myself, one other uh, agent, like a part-time agent. And I had an assistant, um, but I was doing all the prospecting. I was just like a phone monkey, right? I was just cranking it out. And this other team in my office, he said he had a bunch of uh, builder uh, uh, relationships. And this is after the market had sort of leveled out and started coming back up. So he was like, listen, I've got like five agents on my team. We generate a ton of leads. They had just bought one of the most popular websites in our city at the time that was generating business back before everybody had a website. So he was like, man, all my agents are like cherry picking these leads. Like they're going to waste. I know there's tons of money in there and they're just like, they're lazy. He was like, will you come work these leads for me? And I said, listen, man, uh, you know, I'm already doing it for myself. I'm grinding it out. If I do anything, I'm going to teach somebody else how to grind for me. And he's like, great. Let's get together. You come in, teach people to grind for us. And I said, okay, let's do it. We'll build an inside sales department. So I folded in with his company. And at that time, they were doing about 100 transactions a year, had like five agents. So over the course of several years, about three or four years, we grew that up to about 600 transactions and about 30 agents. And we had four or five expansion offices. And I went in, tried to build an inside sales department. Like when you go from being a salesperson to now being like a manager, trainer, leader, huge gap, right? And you just screw it up. I mean, you're like, you're trying to make an omelet, you're breaking eggs all over the place, right? And uh, so that's what I did, wasted money, screwed it up, and tried it a couple times and then went out and got myself educated. I was like, you know what? I, I can't reinvent this wheel. Let me go and find some other people. And at the time, there were a couple teams around the country that, it, that were doing it to a high level. So I went and studied with them, brought it back. And as you know, unfortunately, you can't just get the recipe and make it work the same for some reason in your kitchen. So you got to tweak it a little bit, right? So we figured it out, made it happen and got to the point where I could take a complete stranger off the street and be able to teach them how to produce another 50 to 60 transactions per person for our team in the first year that they're with us. And that was through training and really focused attention and repetition and practice and having a, a high level of skill that we teach them instead of just putting them in a room off to the side with a stack of scripts and saying, figure it out. Let me know when you get something. That's well, the, the story. Agents that you were, were, were teaching at that time. I mean, were these, were these ISAs that you were teaching to do this or were these, did you transition from, you know, building the ISA division and train ISAs to now teaching agents how to uh, you know, follow up on their own? Yeah. So uh, we started with, I w it was a combination of both. I was working with the agents, the outside agents, as well as building the inside sales team. And so what we did is, you know, we went from a situation where all the leads go out to the agents. It was kind of a black box. You didn't know what happened with them or where they went. Or, you know, there was no notes. You know, system. When I say there's no notes in the system, half the people weren't using the system. So we had to revamp the whole sales department as we were growing at the same time and 
teach the agents how to be more effective with what they were doing in their conversations and be uh, better salespeople. And then also get that, systematize it and get them to use the system, convince them to use the system. At the same time that we bring in ISAs, figure out how to teach these people to set appointments for the team quickly, right? Because, you know, it takes the average agent a, a really long time, a, a year, two years to get really confident and be able to convert and close and, and do it all over again, right? But when you're taking ISAs and you're paying them a salary, you gotta do this pretty quickly. You gotta figure it out fast, otherwise they're super expensive. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I remember I, I won, one of the ISAs when I was you know, first starting our model, um, you know, it, it took me about, it didn't take me six months to realize they were the wrong person. It took me six months to just deal with the problem I knew I had, right. yeah, right? Um, well, you looked at that, like between the salary I paid them, you know, right? All the leads that I provide, whatever. I mean, it was a, it was a just over a forty thousand dollar loss. Yeah, yeah, right. It's like, a, like that's you, painful. Man, if you don't hire, hire the right person, get them trained right, and get them producing right away, man, you know, because that that's not even the, the financial hit is. I mean, that's just what I had invested into it. That wasn't the lost commissions that if I had the right person at seat, you know, right? That could have been a quarter million. Yeah, you know, the right? opportunity so, cost. So, um, you know, I'm really curious, dude, to. to you know, because it, it sounds, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds to me like you had the, the skill set on this bad boy. You know, like you knew how to it, close on the phone. So when you started going studying other teams and whatever, like you said, it was like, now I'm in a leadership position. Uh, but my guess is it wasn't the skill set to set the appointment, right? It was more of a, of a leadership systems processes and, yeah. and, and which I think we all go through, like, Dude, it was like your, your ability of being a great real estate agent has nothing to do with your ability of being a great leader and, and no, two different things. And, and um, um, I mean, is that accurate? And, and if so, or, or whatever it is, like when you went out and started studying these other teams, like what were the big ahas and what, what were some of the things that you learned that were key to coming back in? And like you said, man, it's not always like you go copy what somebody else is doing. Like you, there's some tweak times with it, but you know, right. It eventually led to a lot of success. So like, what were some of those, you know, key things that you took away that, that seemed to have that big impact? So I, I want to give you a couple of the really key things that shifted for me in that time. So remember, I went from being essentially a team leader, solo agent, right? Almost. I had one agent with me, but basically being able to call the shots and do everything right. I, I only had to deal with the people I felt like dealing with, right? I could fire clients if I wanted to, no big deal. Now I've joined for, I've basically partnered with somebody in business, right? And that business, I, I now had to work with other people that I didn't necessarily want to work with, right? I didn't have the autonomy to just fire everybody if I felt like it, right? So during that period of time, this is important that I want people to understand because the success, this ties into the success of being able to become a leader. This is how I didn't realize it at the time, but this is how I learned part of how to become a leader was having to do the personal development work for myself so that I could work with people that I didn't like or that I didn't get along with, right? Or that I had difficulty with. And, and I had to really look at myself and say, hey, man, uh, you know, everybody else in this world can't be wrong, right? <laughs> or th there's other people on this team that can work with so-and-so and they can seem to get along with them. Why can't you get along with them, right? What, what is it unique about you that's causing you to have such a problem with them? Or you know, it, it really opened up my eyes. The personal development that I did enabled me to be able to work with a lot of different people. And, and really a big part of that is being able to see the world from somebody else's perspective, right? So being able to understand how I could deal with somebody I couldn't deal with, you have to be able to understand the world from their perspective. Well, guess what? If you want to be a really great leader and you want to really understand people and you want to help them uh, turn up their internal motivation to do things, understand the world from their perspective. That's a huge one. And that's something that I learned going out and seeing these other teams and the way that they ran their inside sales department. This is the other half of it. Um, I, what that caused is it enabled me to see somebody, uh, several people who had already made a large investment. They had already bought the learning curve, right? They had already figured out what didn't work. And they figured out what does work and, and show it to me in a system, right? And it gave me the proper expectations to have, right? So that's when I discovered that you can't find 
and in my market, an $11 an hour person part-time off of Craigslist randomly and expect that they're going to be able to come in and have a conversation with somebody who wants to sell their $450,000 house who's already tried another real estate agent and is pissed off at them, right? That person's not going to be able to do it. I didn't know that prior to going and checking things out, right? We were trying to do it as cheap as possible. And that's what I find a lot um, when clients come to us and they want help getting this stuff set up. One of the big mistakes they make, you know, listen, we all want to save a dollar, right? We all want to try to get by without wasting money. The problem is when people try to do something that requires money, they try to do it on the cheap. That's when you get into trouble and you end up wasting more money than you would have if you just did it right the first time. So that's what we did wrong. We tried to cheap out a couple of times and then got slapped in the face and realized okay, we're going to have to do this real. We went and saw those other high level productions and we were like, okay, well this, it costs real money to do this, right? If you're going to do it right. Yeah. Love it, man. So and we'll get into, get into that for sure. Cause it's, you know, one of the things that I think so many people struggle with is, is setting up the right compensation plans, you know, right. Um, you know, and, and I'm a huge believer of, of win-win comp plans. Like I want my people to get rich, right. Cause if they get rich, then I'm getting right. Like, you know, right. And, and, yeah. and I, I want to, we'll definitely get into that. But before we do, man, I'm, um, um, you know, you brought up such an awesome point. And this is something like, I mean, dude, I, I've been in the business since 2005. So in May, will be 14 years and been running my team for 13. And, you know, it's like, look, we've always just plugged people into our system. You know, like we've got our, you know, here, here's our playbook. Here's our operations manual. Now we've got all video and we've walked them through and that's like plug into this system. Well, one of my really good friends that is now on my real estate team, who just has been with us for six months and I went through this. Um, she was a, a teacher for a decade. And, um, um, but then, you know, through the school system, she got to the point where she was um, um, like the head of designing the whole curriculum. Yeah. Right. And we're talking for that. I mean, this is the fourth best school district in the whole entire nation. A couple years wow. ago, like she got to go hang out with Bill Gates for the day. And they, oh, they, wow. you know, they, nice. they were the first school district to implement his, uh, you know, his new funded education, uh, uh, you know, system for, for public schools and, like, like this chick, she's a badass when it comes to education. Wow. And, uh, um, um, now that she's went through this and now I'm, you know, we're working so deeply and, and, and you know, just thank God that, you know, it, sometimes we just get lucky and have those people show up in our <laughs> lives. Right. But, but the, like, look, dude, like, just because it will work for us doesn't mean it's going to work for everybody else. And that, that, that quote, the, 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 the teacher appears when the student is ready. Right. Well, you've got to facilitate the environment that they need to learn best. And everybody yeah. learns differently. Everybody learns from different styles. And and like you said, man, like we may not mesh, we may not click, you know, what what how like you might be they might be driven by something different, motivated by something different. And that is such a hard thing of a leader is is it's like you got to adapt to everybody else. It's not, you know, I maybe Steve Jobs didn't have to. Yeah, right. But yeah. we're not Steve Jobs, you know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. When you get to, listen. When you get to be Steve Jobs, when you if you are Steve Jobs, great. If you can bend the river around you, you go for it, right? But most of the rest of us, we got to flow with the river. We don't get to bend it. In the reality, Steve Jobs had amazing people around him that were the bridge for it, right? So, yeah. so you know, I, I I don't know if he'd ever create the success that he had if if he didn't have those people around him to to get the people to do that that type of work and and show up that way. So, um, um, you know, so I love that you brought that up, man. And and so, um. You know, one question that I have, dude, and I guess this kind of segues into, you know, the comp plan a little bit, but, you know, I, I've got a coaching, you know, mentorship program, you know, I don't want to say it's like yours because mine's all, I don't know, all your structure was we'll talk about. Um, I'll give you well. a plug. I've, I've, I've gone through your webinar. It's great stuff, man. Okay, it's cool. Yeah. Very so, helpful. Yeah. Mine's all group and it's, you know, my whole mission is effective and affordable. So there's no one-on-one -on -one or anything like that, but, um, you know, through that, man, I mean, I have a couple thousand people here that come through my programs that I'm always interacting with. And dude, everybody out there, like you talked about, is trying to skimp, right? Um, is, is hiring these outsourced third-party ISA companies. And I get asked about them all the time. I'm like, I've yet to ever see a good one. Yeah, right? And they, and they never don't listen to me. It's like when you buy your first investment property, um, um, you know, those that I know that have success with it. And, and you know, I ran the ISA. We actually just dissolved our ISA department and, and uh uh, like two weeks ago, um, um, and, and, and which we can get into later if, if we want, if we have time and want to, but, um, 
Um, cause I mean, the ISA department was extremely effective and extremely profitable and, and a great department. It was just, I wanted one focus. Right. And I had, a, I felt like I had to pick and choose, right. To go big and go fast. I just wanted one focus and, yeah. and, and, and it's just slower to scale and, and different things. So, but also, you know, I, before I did, that's a price should have hired you to, you know, I, I, I could have just made a big mistake. <laughs> well, find that's out. a plug. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Um, um, you know, uh, uh, but dude, like, you know, I, Everybody I know that has them, it has them in house, you know, right? Yeah. Um, and and but invest the time and the energy and training has a higher protocol. Like we were just talking about our, our, our mutual good friend Chantel Ray. Like, look, dude, like she she is going out, and when she hires an ISA man, I got to have two years minimum of of phone sales experience. She yeah. knows the best Fortune 500 companies that have the best training programs. So so she's going after and targeting and and headhunting the right you know people that have the experience that have been with the right programs. Like that, like, you know, it's not like she's just going out there, oh, I'm a certain ISA program, you know, whatever. And no. Like, like she's, you know, right? she's hiring the right people with the right yeah. training. I know that, you know, and even with that, I mean, she, she was closing 90 deals a month with her ISA division before she hired you to help her, right? So she's still yeah. like, she's, I mean, just think about that. Of She still is humble and, and enough to know that they still need to learn and grow. You know, right? Yeah. And that's what it takes, man. So, yeah. you know, with that, man, kind of, kind of talk to us like it, Cause I get it. Agents hate the phones. Don't want to do it. It'd be nice if we set the appointments, you know, whatever, but kind of talk to us about if I were to start, if I was an agent with a, you know, decent sized team, or like, I mean, I'm going all over the place. Let me, let me retract that. If I wanted to go with the, like the, down the ISA road, at what point um, um, do I know I'm ready to do that? You know, right. I'm um, just like, yeah. Everybody wants an admin. Well, dude, like you, you got to understand, like it could be nine months of paying that admin before you start seeing an ROI. And you got to, you got to be at a certain level. You yeah. can't be, you should be closing 20 deals a year and think you're going to hire an admin, right? So no. got to be you ready. Be missing, you need to be missing paperwork, like not turning your shit in before you hire an admin, right? Yeah. Like I was, where you had a signed listing agreement sitting on your desk for three months that you forgot to turn in. Like you need to be at that level before you have an admin. Yeah, couldn't agree more. I, it's, it's nothing wrong with wanting it, but you do you you take action when it's necessary, right? So, um, so when when does an agent know that they're ready? And then if so, like how would they be prepared to set them up for like how long does it take? Skill sets, financial investment, kind of like walk us through so like they know if and when it's right for them. Yeah, definitely. Oh, and by the way, don't leave a listing agreement sitting on your desk for three months. That's <laughs> really bad. I, I managed to get lucky and sold that one the first week I actually put it on the market, but it could have been really bad. And the only way that I knew it was sitting there is because the seller called me up and he's like, what happened to you? I haven't heard from you. This was a mixed use property, by the way. It wasn't somebody's house. Anyway, I digress. That turned out okay, but don't do that. Um, so yeah, it, you can know that you're ready. And I get this question a lot. Uh, you want to have two, first of all, you don't want to hire an ISA if you are not a phone prospector, but you just want somebody to prospect for you. Okay. Never do that. There's a couple of reasons why, because if you're not a phone prospector, you don't know how to be a phone prospector and you sure don't know how to teach somebody to be a phone prospector. Okay. And that ISA is not going to ever do any better than you've done. So don't do that. Well, can I, can I pause you on that? Cause I want to, sure. I think it's, it's very important, relevant to what you just said of like, I hate the phones as much as anybody. I hate them, dude. I hate like when my phone rings, man. It like, I get a little bit of anxiety. Like, I hate it. <laughs> yeah, right now I forced myself to do it or whatever, but uh, um, I would never say that I was a good phone prospector, but could I, if I wanted to develop at that department, if I hired the right person to coach and oversee them, yeah, yes. like, like with me not being like, dude, I have never sat there and crushed a thousand you know, calls a week and I never have, right? Um, so I may not be the best person to train them, but if mm -hmm. I wanted to do it and I had you or like your company training them in the oversight, you know, then, you know, is it something that you would, would be okay? Or is it just like, look, dude, if you don't have that skill set, then no. You, uh, as long as you have somebody with the experience to train them. Right. You can't because you can't you like you can't learn to dance from a book. Right. So if even if you're a team leader and you want to hire an ISA to do outbound prospecting, in addition to the, you know, nurturing stuff, absolutely do that. Just make sure that you get good training, whether it's my company or you hire somebody in house, whatever it is. Right. You get them good training. I think I was speaking more about thinking about either the solo agent or the real small team, like one or two people, right? Uh, for, in that case, if you want to get an ISA, 
go ahead and get good training for them, but don't think that you're going to train them on your own, right? And especially if you're a solo agent, because I've, I've run into this before, solo agents will be like, hey man, you know, I do relationship business, but I know I'm missing business with expireds and FISBOs and whatever else. How about I just hire somebody to go and do that for me? Probably not a good idea. You also don't want to just hire an ISA to only solely do outbound in my, my suggestion, right? Because an ISA is a big time commitment, training commitment, and dollar commitment. So what you, the ideal situation is you have too many inbound leads for you to appropriately follow up with these things and nurture relationships with them and you start missing things, right? Your database has too much in it. You have too many opportunities for you to actually talk to those people. That's when you're starting to get to the zone of, I should, like an admin, right? You got too many deals going on, too much paperwork going on, or too many agents that, you know, you want to provide that leverage. An ISA should be leverage for you so that they can do outbound and they can handle your inbound and they can manage your database. They're, I would look at them like a relationship manager, right? They manage the relationships that could be had and could be formed in your business while you're out showing houses, writing contracts, negotiating, networking, doing whatever else you're doing. Yeah. And, and again, our, our team, when we had like, cause general public's not going to know what an ISA is. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. so, you know, they introduce themselves as, is um, um, part of, or head of uh, the customer experience department. So their job yeah. was to identify the goals, their, their needs, what they're looking for, get a very clear picture on that and make sure based on what those are that they team them up with the best real estate agent within our team that specializes in, in what they're looking for to ensure that they have the best experience, you know, customer experience, you know, yeah. just, the pass off becomes kind of funky, you know, right. Uh, uh, with the ISA where, you know, like we had it, maybe this is a mistake because it had a, a lower capacity for us, but it was even like, it was like, Hey, like reassuring them that, look, I don't want you to, you know, feel like uh, um, I'm going to work with you and then, you know, pass you off if you will. Right? I'm going to, I'm going to continue to be involved. Yeah. Right. So, so as you, as we get you with the best agent on the team and take care of your needs and, and make sure that your real estate goals are accomplished. You know, I'm going to be checking in uh, every couple of weeks with you. You're going to have all my information. Um, Cause I, again, my job is to make sure that this is the most exceptional experience for you. Um, and if it, if it's not, you need to reach out to me right away. And like, we've had it where they didn't click with the agent, where they'll pull them and get into mm -hmm. the lender or whatever. Now that yeah. might have bogged us down because our ISAs were still checking with me, even when they're working with the agent, even when they're on closing, you know, mm -hmm. right. But, we were also wanting to be careful of, we knew our agents wouldn't fall past clients. So yeah. the way I came in past client made it easy for the ISA to the, the con, you know, constant, constant you yeah. know, fall call. So is that kind of what you're, you're talking about of, of the approach of having them involved in more than just setting the appointment? Not actually, no. What we teach instead of doing that, we don't even say anything about it. So we teach that the customer cares person, the ISA, basically they are the person. Like I, you are my client. I am working with you. We are talking, right? So long as it's only email, text, and phone, the point at which you agree to a face-to-face -face appointment, that's when it goes from great. How about we get together on Wednesday at five? They say, good, we're going to do that. Okay. Wonderful. You're going to be meeting with my partner, Jim, on Wednesday at five, right? And that's the, that's the handoff. That's it. Nothing more said unless the person objects. Occasionally they object, right? And so the ISA just says, oh yeah, no, Jim's my partner. He's very skilled in this. And you know, really he handles the outside part of this and I handle the inside part of this. And, and they usually accept that as an answer. Only every once in a while would somebody be like, no, I've, I've been talking to you and I only want you and, and that's the way it has to be. In that case, the ISA would invite them to come into the office to, they can meet the ISA, meet the ISA's partner, right? And everything is great. And then, you know, 99% of the time that person goes off and continues working with that uh, new, with that agent, but we don't ever say it's a handoff. We don't ever say anything about it. It's just a, Hey, my partner's going to handle the showings. My partner's gonna, like a showing agent, right? Yeah. So then the ISA will check back in after that first appointment. We'll check back in after that uh, listing appointment and see how things went. Right. And that's the, that's the point where you can troubleshoot if they didn't click with that agent. And we know sometimes they don't click with the agent, right? So that's when they can be like, okay, no problem. Listen, I can have you talk to my partner, Kelly, and, you know, reassign them. And then because the ISA manages the database, 
the way that we ran it on that team is that they could also um, manage the relationships of anyone that they had touched in the past, right? So as the ISAs are generating what essentially are now past clients that are co-owned by the ISA, now they're working that database as well. So now we have a staff person who's doing both outbound prospecting, inbound lead receiving, nurturing, as well as nurturing the past client database. And we gave the agents an option to let this ISA nurture their personal database too, if they wanted that done. And you know, like half of them like to have that done for themselves. So that that's what I'm talking about. The, the person can really be a staff relationship manager that, you know, I mean, as you know, it's really hard to manage independent contractors, right? Who are hundred percent commission. But when you have a salaried person, you can really outline what they do and make sure they're getting it done. Yeah. And then um, you talk about the, either knowing how, having the skill set to know how to truly train them and or hiring a, you know, an outside person to, to be able to, to handle that process for you. Then what about like, you know, I'm a, I used to not always be this way until I discovered the power in it and, and the pain also of not doing it about four or five years into my career. Um, but now, I mean, I'm a data tracking freak, right? Like, I mean, I'm a, I mean, there's not a piece of data that I don't know that I don't track and I don't obsess over, right? Which may, may not even, maybe I'm, I might take it to the extreme, right? Um, but I'm, I'm a, you know, like I'm, a, I'm, you know, a high C, C is my dominant on my disc, right? So way better um, than not having any data. Yeah. So then, but then from there too, like, you know, what is the importance of, of having that track? Cause you can, you can train your people all day long. You'd be brilliant on the phone, but then from there, like, like, you know, setting those parameters of like, Hey, if they're below this key point, that's a red flag. But then also without that track data, you don't necessarily know, you know, like what, uh, um, I guess where they need coaching and help. So, yeah. you know, from a, from a tracking standpoint, somebody's going to hire an ISA, like what are some of the you know, key data points or KPIs that, you know, you track or, or recommend that they track um, and pay attention to? So the first one is going to be, you know, once you've gotten them uh into integrated into your systems. They know the systems, they know the software, they know what they're supposed to be doing. The important things that they, you would be tracking is how many attempts are they making, right? How many dials are they making? And it's not, so when I'm managing ISAs, it's not that I'm necessarily going to immediately hold you accountable to the number of dials that you're making, but I'm just, that's gonna be a reference point down the road if your performance is lacking, right? Because the way, actually I'll start from the end back because we always manage to the outcomes, right? What are the expectations? What are the outcomes, right? So my personal management style is like, hey, ISA, your job is to generate five new closings per month, right? And I don't care what you do, how you do it, if you have peanut butter and jelly smeared on it, as long as you come in with five closings in the month, right? Great, and then if you don't, we're gonna work backwards to figure out what happened, where did the system break? And so from closings, we're going to look backward to contracts signed, right? And then we're going to look back to appointments met. And then we're going to look at appointments set, right? What's your set to met ratio? What's that met to signed ratio? And then what's your signed to closed ratio, right? So we're working that back. From appointments set, we're going to look at contacts made. And then we're going to look at dial your dial time or attempts or how many dials did you make, right? That, those are really the key metrics right there. And so if the closings don't come in, we're going to look at the contracts. How many contracts did you, did your work generate for the month, right? And if we're lacking on the contracts, then we're going to look back to what's the relationship of how many appointments you set to how many appointments actually got conducted, right? And then from there, what's the relationship between conducted appointment to contract signed? And is this a quality issue with you or is it a quality issue with the agents that you're giving appointments to? Then we dial it back from appointment set to how many conversations are you having to actually get an appointment, right? And we see, you've probably found this, a, a new ISA on an average lead mix in our industry will come in at around 40 to 50 or even 55 uh, conversations to an appointment. And then as you work on training them, you work on their skills, you listen to what they're doing, you coach them, they can whittle that down or you improve the number or quality of leads. They can work that down. And some of the best ISAs I've seen on an average lead mix get down to under 20 contacts to an appointment, to like down to like 15 contacts to an appointment. 
And then the other key metric, the thing that's important to make sure that you're looking at to judge your ISA's performance is how many leads did I give you? How many opportunities did I give you? Not including circle prospecting stuff because the conversion on that is so low. But in your average lead mix between outbound, like expireds, FISBOs, inbound, web registrations, valuations, whatever it is, uh, sign calls, how many at-bats did we give you, right? To see what, how that all shakes out. To make sure you're giving them enough. Then you look at how many contacts, how many appointments, what's your ratios, and, and how's that, you know, playing out? Yeah, and then we, so then um, because people people have different strengths at different different sources, right? Like somebody might really shine at Fizbo's but suck at expires. Or like when I hired my first ISA, it was probably about four years ago. You know, I'm like, look, bro, dude, like I have no idea where you're gonna shine at, so we're gonna call everything for the next ninety days. <laughs> um, now we're not gonna have a lot of closings in that time, like that, or maybe even any. We don't know yet. We'll see. Um, but we can make a judgment off of appointment set. You know, by then we should have some good data. And, and uh, I was, it was just over 90%. It was, you know, almost all of them that he had set were from Facebook. You know, right? Face, now, these are wow. you know, Facebook leads that were coming in with, with names, numbers, whatever, which, you know, which just that figure that you said, it took, it took about two years, um, um, but got him down to, to one appointment set per 16 conversations. And then we're at um, uh, four. From Facebook leads. That's, imp that's impressive, man. Yeah. And, 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 but again, these are – you know, it's not outbound expires or harassing people. I don't want to be harassing. These are people that are opting in, giving us their cell, and yeah. and 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 uh, um, you know, with that. So, um, and it took a long time, right? So to to get it to that point. So I, I'm just sharing that of like, look, the numbers that you just shared are also like, you know, like they're not. You know, we've seen that to hold true, not just in my business, but my my you know, top team leader friends that have ISA departments that that seems pretty congruent. So, um, um, uh, with that, um. Uh, but then when it comes to that, so then I'm guessing, or I don't know, maybe, maybe not. When you talk about a lead mix, what is the importance of, of, of tracking each lead sort? Like, each, like almost having a different tracker for expireds compared to Facebook, compared to Facebook, right? To really know where they shine at and where they should focus their time at. You know what? Um, I've never actually done it that way. So the way that I've always done it is we look at what is our marketing ROI, right? So we look at it by lead source. And, and what we look at is from the appointment set perspective, like appointments, contracts, closings by lead source and what the um, income generated, what did we spend and what did we make and how many leads did we get so we can understand the cost per lead and all that stuff. So that was, was over here. But when with the ISAs myself, I never brought it all the way back. What I always wanted to do is I wanted to keep my ISAs as lean on their tracking as possible because what I, you know, what, what, the, what the magic for them, the way that we monetize them is conversations, appointments, contracts, closings, right? Not, you know, dicking around in the CRM or filling out additional things or doing lots of data stuff. So from my perspective, so I always try to keep it, run it as lean as possible. And what I would do is I wanted my ISAs to, understand themselves and know what they were strong at and really just task them with the results and say, here's the leads. We're pushing them in here. You make these results happen over here. And what we would do is we would recycle leads. So if you had an ISA who knew that they were, were was good at expireds and FISBOs, they would naturally gravitate toward that, right? So they would work those expired than the FISBOs. And what would happen is they wouldn't work something that they weren't as good at. So we would take the excess leads that they had and every quarter or so we would shift those leads around to the other ISAs. So we're like recycling leads to make sure that whoever has a particular strength, they're going to get an opportunity to take more of those leads from somebody else. But we didn't do it in real time, which something like, you know, it sounds like something you'd be able to do, right? If you said, Hey, this is my expired guy and, and this is my, you know, Facebook lead guy. Yeah. I didn't do it that way. I, I cross trained everybody on everything and then tasked them with coming up with the results. Yeah. I love that, man. Well, and, and here's the thing is, you know, um, um, because like I said, I'm, I'm a you know, tracking freak, you know I mean? That's, that's how I wanted it done, but I also just dissolved my ISA. Right? So it doesn't mean, cause like you said, man, I, it, dude, it's just like getting agents to track the numbers, you know, the ISA, like you want to keep them on their focus. And at the end of the day, dude, you know, when we have the data, we can, 
any admin can can backtrack it, know where it came from. Now you can get back to how that came in, and I like that the keeping them just laser focused because it is hard, man, uh, to do the amount of dials it takes. You know, I was just looking at uh, um, um, our main uh, lead ISA, um, who's still on my team, but he uh, they just kind of created their own ISA team within the team. You know, um, so just him last year, not counting any of the ISAs, like it was like forty five thousand dials, right? Um, which I think led to to um, did lead to 60 closings, right? So, nice. um, you know, I don't have the tracker right in front of me of, of everything in between there. Um, you know, but dude, I mean, $45,000 a year, I mean, that's, that's and then a, you know, a couple hundred a day to do that. And even you know, people using dialers or whatever, it is a lot, man. So if you bog them down on all this other shit and it slows down the process, it, you know, whatever. So now I'm not, you know, I, I think that that is, you know, probably the way to go now that effort, you know, I've experienced it of, you know, because I, I definitely bogged them down too much, right? Because I was having them also then oversee the, because we're, we're, you know, 70% buy side business. So, you know, then they're following up with the lender, make sure the lender's doing their job. And it was, they were way mm, too yeah. bogged down, right? Um, yeah. um, uh, with that. So um, what do you, what do you recommend then? Uh, I mean, as far as, is there a system that you recommend? Like, a, I don't know, like there's some cool ones out there like dial pad or, or um, what I hear, what I, I saw, um, uh, it, air call, you know, right? Some of these like call center phone systems that like will track all of that. So the, I mean, do you have any systems that you recommend that people can use to keep them focused from like a dial system that they dial out of that you can look at anytime and, and get their, their dials to conversations. Yeah. You know, right. Um, so from a systematic standpoint, like, what, what do you like? You know what? I don't recommend any one over the other. And here's the reason why, because when coaching and training all these different varying levels of teams and sizes of team and focus of a team, uh, we, what we've done is just really focused on the principles of what you need tracked. So the short answer is I don't have one in particular that I use. That's like a catch all. Um, all, all I know is that every one of the systems have some kind of hole in them, something that they won't track. And so for, I, I have not, I have yet to be proven wrong that if you set up a really good Excel spreadsheet, which, you know, we have great Excel tracker sheets, that there's going to be a flaw in it, right? And you can get a VA or you can get somebody else to pull the data, stick it into the tracker for you and show you exactly what you want to see, right? Um, I just haven't seen any of these call center ones. And, you know, in our industry, most people just use Mojo, right? So, uh, you know, it, it, I can't get them, I wouldn't be able to get them off of Mojo onto like a 5.9 or something, which is like a crazy complicated one so uh, honestly what we give our clients and we use with our with people that we're training is just our excel trackers right that are going to show you the kpis that you need it's super easy to put the info into short answer to that one yeah not a lot of, it's, it's the same thing for myself and any top producer that i know of because there is no complete system everyone's got a hole in it which you know it sucks and I know. Cool, there would be the complete system but there's no oh. Yeah, you right. try to sniff it out, right? You try to sniff it out. You do your best. You do demos. You try the thing. Yeah. And then not until you commit and you load all your stuff into it, are you then like, wait a minute, what do you mean it can't do this? Right? And you're like, oh. Now, is there, are, you, are you pro, like you said, like with Mojo, um, are you pro using a power dialer or? or yes. Okay. Um, Definitely. Cool. And then um, um, a question I get all the time, but be, being a guy that hates the phones, I've had, I've been done a dial in probably you know, I don't know, ten years. Um, that's a bad. Um, that's a badge to wear. Did yeah. not need to make a phone call in ten years. And, yeah, look I, like I, and my whole thing was like, I'm, I, I hate it so much that I'm going to get good, good, so good at it that I can create enough monetary success where I can just outsource and never do it again. Right. So nice. that's genius. Know, so. Um, That's way smarter than the rest of us who just like bashed our heads against it for a really long time. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's a cool thing about real estate or any business, a thousand ways to, to create success, right? So yeah. um, um, the question I get all the time, dude, is um, like a headset. Like I see you got a, like your head set head on right now, super clear. Um, do you have any, like what, what would you recommend to that agent that is asking that question? Yeah, so Logitech, this is a Logitech, and they have pretty good noise canceling. Um, there are some like trucker headsets like Blue Parrot or Blue something else. Um, those are really good and everybody swears by them and they have really excellent noise canceling. One of the problems is that they're like over the ear. And so you can't hear one thing I have to be able to hear myself, right? Otherwise, I get confused. And they are so good at like, 
isolating sound that you can't hear yourself. There's no feedback of what you're doing. Um, that's just my one caveat. So I actually tried one of those blue parrot ones and they're amazing with the noise canceling, but I had to return it because I just, I couldn't, I was losing track of what I was saying. I couldn't hear what I was doing. So just like a simple, I mean, this one is like a cordless Logitech, um, gamer headset type things. They have really good noise canceling in them. How long is that? Cause it's, uh, it's, like it's off wireless. How long does it hold a, a charge? Can you get through a full day of, of straight down without having to, before it lose juice? I just did this one for our coaching calls, but this one doesn't hold its juice that long. I mean, I get maybe like a day of use out of this one. So I wouldn't recommend, I don't even remember what model this is. Um, but I would go for one of the higher, one of the higher end models that uh, where your battery lasts longer because you know, I mean, if you're an ISA or, or agent who's prospecting, you're putting in a ton of hours on that thing. So, you, you know, if you get the ones that are wireless, the, usually they'll have like a cradle that sits on your desk that you can put it into at the end of the day, recharge it. And it will also, you know, they can connect to your cell phone. It can connect wirelessly to your laptop, to your computer. Um, and that's a really convenient way you can get up and pace. I like to pace when I'm prospecting. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the, the problems you ever think that you would have of, you know, our guys are always, you know, it's like, okay, the Apple Ear, Ear, AirPods are loving those, but they're like, we're straight dialing. You're lucky to get two hours before they die, you know, right? Yeah. Of, of, you know, just shit like that. So uh, I just wanted to ask. So then, all right, so when you, when you hire an ISA, let's say somebody is, is ready to go. Um, yeah, they've got the tracking in place. They've got all those things that we already talked about. Um, when it comes to, uh, um, you know, recommended compensation plans, but is also as well as um, um, understanding what that investment is going to be before they start seeing results. You know, right. It's just, just like, man, like so many people are like, Oh, I'm going to start doing all these direct mail pieces. And then they, they do it for 90 days and they stop. Like, they're like, man, this is expensive and nobody called me. Yeah. You know, and, and again, I don't know if I did it right or, or, or not, you know, right. Um, but it, it, I mean, it took us a year to, to, to start getting like, you know, a pretty good ROI on that, you know, right. For the, yeah. I mean, for the first six months, it was a bleeding cash. Right. Um, yeah. um, you know, that next six, 12 months was, you know, essentially making a little bit of money, but really, really at the end of the day, pretty much just breaking even at a year though, you know, right. Is when the, the margins started getting really good, you know, right. Um, at two years, they started getting amazing, you know, right. Yeah. Um, um, you know, the last year before it stopped, I mean, I invested, you know, I think 16 grand to, to make 300 between the leads to make 300 yeah. grand. Um, you know, but it was, but it took that long to scale it. Right. So, yeah. um, um, but also we're only calling you know, Facebook inbound leads, which is, takes more time than like an expired might be sooner or whatever. But when it comes to those two things, expectation on time frame, so that they have the finances to be ready to fund it um, mm -hmm. um, and, and have accurate expectations for, for when that ROI kicks in um, yeah. um, as, as well as comp plans. Like let's hit on that. Yeah. So I would definitely recommend hiring full time if you can, unless you just happen to know somebody with, you know, who's pretty good as a salesperson or has the ability to do it and you, but you already know them. I just find it really difficult to hire somebody, a stranger part time and get any kind of quality, uh, me personally anyway. So I would recommend going full time and you can either do an hourly pay, right? And just see what's an average hourly pay in your market. So that could be, you know, in some areas, it could be 10 bucks an hour. Some area, you know, my area, you'd probably pay 15 bucks an hour to get somebody to do this for you part time. Or you would consider hiring them full time. And the average base salary is somewhere between $2,000 and $2,500 a month. And then you want to set up some kind of bonus comp plan because it's going to be, you know, we way back in the day, we would just <clears throat> pay a flat. Uh, salary monthly and then only bonus them on their uh, closings, right? But it can take six months before they start to see closings from their efforts, right? So that's six months of this person only living on 2000 or 2500 a month. The people, the people out there who can do that and are also in the group of people you actually want to hire, very few of those, right? So you can bonus people on key things like appointments met or, you know, certain, even maybe even in the first couple of weeks, we have a team that we're working with uh, out of Miami right now. And we've developed a great comp plan where in the first week, they just have to hit certain metrics like number of contacts made and they can get a little bump or, uh, you know, number of one or two appointments set, they can get a little bump. And then you switch it over from set to met. Now we're looking for actual met appointments, right? 
and we're going to bump you on that one. And then we're going to switch that over to contract signed. And then eventually it's going to taper off into closings. That's the kind of comp plan that you can put together. So I would suggest that you have at least, you know, three to six months of this person's salary already saved up and ready to go because you know you're going to have that expense. Depending on the time of year that you do this, as we know, most for most real estate teams, it's a cyclic, you know, it's a seasonal cycle, right? So you don't want high expenses in the wintertime. Um, so have that earmarked to be able to pay that person so that you're also not sweating about it and watching them every single day. You know, Josh, right now, my wife and I, are, we're doing Weight Watchers, right? We're, we're, both, we're both doing Weight Watchers, losing weight. And we've been having this really bad habit of looking at the scale every day, right? And you're like, you can't, you're going to drive yourself bananas if you're looking at that scale every day. Likewise, you can't be looking over your ISA shoulder every day, right? And saying, hey, did you earn the dollars today? Or hey, did, did you make appointments happen? Or did you make a closing happen today, right? You can't look at it every day. So have that money earmarked so you're not freaking out about it. And then uh, that's the comp plan. When you, we're talking about getting them ramped up, right? You want to have a really clear 30, 60, 90 day plan to where you're going to have certain metrics, certain benchmarks that they have to hit that you know that if they hit these in 30, 60, 90, that they're on the right trajectory to being the kind of person that can actually do this. Because the reality is, and I'm sure you figured this out too, Josh, you know, a few times is you don't really know until at least like three to six months out, whether this person is going to be, can really do it. Right. So if you have that good 30, 60, 90 of benchmarks that you're going to be measuring them against, you can make a, a, a keep them or let them go decision after 60 or 90 days and have it, you know, for legal purposes, especially backed up by here's what the job was, right? This is what we said you needed to hit, but also so that you can understand whether it's the right position for them or not, because in this, you do want to exit with somebody sooner than later who is not going to be able to perform and not going to be able to do it because they're not going to be fulfilled. You're not going to be fulfilled and they're not going to be profitable. Yeah. Now with those benchmarks, is it, are they you know, the same all the way throughout or is it like, Hey, for the first 30 days, because I want them to just develop the habit. I also want to see how they can do this. Like the first 30 days might just be, you know, uh, dials made the next 30 days yeah. might be conversations. The last 30 days might be an appointment set benchmark. Are they different or is it just kind of, you know, the same, you know, dials, conversations and appointments set, um, um, but just different, you know, different volumes of that through the 90 days. Yeah, they are slightly different. So in the first 30, they're learning systems, right? They're getting ramped up. So in the first 30, you want to be able to get them up to being able to make a, a, a certain minimum number of contacts every single day, right? And I'm not, we don't even talk about dials because if we focus on you have to be able to consistently make this number of contacts every day, what that means is they're going to have to put in the dials and they're going to have to figure out the systems, the CRM, going to meetings, their schedule, all that stuff in order to be um, proficient enough to be able to get that number of contacts every single day. So that's one of the first key metrics in the first 30. You know, you're going to have the training plan for them. They're going to have completed it, but then they're going to be able to reach X number of contacts every single day, um, be able to get up to that. And then uh, in the first 30, you're also going to have a couple of appointments set criteria for them. Now, for most new ISAs you're going to hire, they're going to be setting crap appointments when they first set appointments because they don't know good appointments from bad appointments, right? And, and any salesperson can get most people to say yes, can get people to say yes to them who shouldn't say yes to them. So then in the second 30 days and 60 days, now you're going to be maintaining a certain level of contacts consistently and you're going to have a, a higher number of appointments set and that's when we're going to start looking at appointments met, right? X number of appointments met and possibly a contract signed. And the third, now we're going to have contacts, sets, mets, contract signed. And then from there, we start moving into looking at closings. Are we able to get closings from this person? So that's the really simplified version of a 30, 60, 90. Yeah, love it, man. And, and uh, yeah, I think one thing that, you know, I just want to kind of uh, just – kind of hit on again just to make sure our audience heard it is like when you're bonusing throughout setting set parameters right like 
Um, I didn't bonus on appointments conducted um, alone, right? It had to be an appointment that, conduct, that, that was conducted that showed up and met with the agent, right? That was somebody that was looking to buy or sell within six months, right? And the agent had to, to verify it. Um, um, and with, like with the buy side to get a buyer broker, that was easy with, with in less than six months. But, um, you know, a listing agreement can be harder, but we had those parameters where the agent had to verify it. You know, so like when they got that $50 bonus, um, um, it, it keeps it out. Uh, people always are going to maximize their, their paychecks, right? Yeah. Um, um, so it, cause we've seen people, other teams where do they're setting crazy appointments. We're like, well, dude, like it's like uh, our good I are 25 to 30 a month. Right. And we start seeing these other people setting a hundred and some. Right. But then what we found is, dude, the appointments at the closing, they might be one out of 16, but we're one out of five, <laughs> you know, right. Like right. Really betting those. So, cause you also yeah. have to be really careful and cognizant of, man, you, I mean, yeah, you got the ISA, but it's so easy to bring out your agents. You know, oh, right? yeah. um, so you gotta be careful. You send your agents on a couple of bunk appointments. Guess what? They're suddenly going to be more reluctant to go on those appointments. Yep. Yep. Um, and then with comp plans, man, what, what would your advice be? You know, I see so many agents, they don't think, they don't think far enough ahead where let's just say they're still in production, like how they, you know, they might be bonusing uh, admin and, and, and paying their ISAs, you know, right. Not understanding how hard margins get hit when they step yeah. out of production. You know, right. Oh, yeah. um, and, and like I hear, you know, it's here's some comp plans. I'm like, do that. There's no way you're going to freaking make money unless you can get your agents to, to only work off 25% of that. Like how the hell are you going to make money? You know, but right. they don't think about that. So when they're, when they're talking about the bonuses and uh, um, and I know it's gotta be different because everybody's price points, different commissions are different, different markets. Um, um, but what would you be your advice there of, of just making sure that you don't fuck yourself down the road with your comp plan? Meaning how much would you pay? How much would you compensate your ISA like on the commission? And, and, and maybe not even, uh, it doesn't have to be a figure, but of a, uh, you know, okay, hey, like, like, let's just say most team leaders that I know, you know, right, that are in production, they're usually 75% of the commission still coming in. They, they might be closing the, the 100 deals a year and they yeah. got three, four agents that are maybe popping another 30 deals, right? Um, yeah. But they start basing, you know, they're like, oh, my ROI right now is this and our money's this and our margins are this. Um, but they base things based off their current margins, not with the thought process of, okay, when I step out of production, right, my, my agent's probably going to convert quite as good. They're not going to beat me, right? They may not be able to convert quite as good. You know, right? When they go on the appointments, maybe I'll be able to convert quite as good. Plus, now I have all the expenses when I'm only getting 50% of the commission, not 100%, right? So, yeah. um, just a future think of, because it is hard to change comp plans down the road when everybody's using that. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> and not have a mutiny. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's obviously one of those things that you really got to focus on. And, you know, plan for the future, right? So, if you want to be out of production a few years down the road, definitely plant, bake that in, right? Before you take on that ISA, knowing that you're going to pay them, you know, 5% or 7% of GCI, whatever it is, if you choose to do it that way, uh, which that's pretty common, you're really going to have to bake that in and make sure that it jives with your model. Uh, or you may have to, you know, go back to the, uh, you may have to go with your, your handout, you know, with your, with your, pan in your hands to the team and say, Hey, I, I want to start an ISA department. They're going to handle these leads for you. They're going to convert for you. They're going to set appointments for you. How much would you be willing to pay them out of the commission for that and get them to take it out of their side, right? You may actually have to do a little retrading on that deal to be able to bring in an ISA department and, and keep it profitable so that, you know, like you said, at the end of the day, you don't die, right? So you don't go broke. I mean, it's not a, it ain't a charity. Yeah. Yeah. My, uh, uh, you know, first ISA who is the, you know, was the most successful at still, still with us nowadays and has it's his, his own, actually he's building a team within the team now. He's actually right outside of my office right now at Island. Um, um, you know, we didn't know what we didn't know, but he, but he was also in a position, right. Where he had, you know, money to live off of for a year or so and was a different position most, but that's perfect. You know, right. I, I was like, I would have no salary, no, whatever. I, I gave him two options, you know, salary, or I was just like, dude, we'll do an 80, 20 split. You get 20% of everything that closes that you procure. Um, and being a great talented sales guy, like he, he took the 20%, right. Which sucked for him for the first year. Yeah. You know, yeah. Right? But then as he started to grow, I started looking at him like, damn, dude, now, you know, <laughs> you're already sort of seeing that, but you know, what it, it still was a win. Right. Um, but it's either, if you're not careful, right. It's either, either 
the ISA wins, the agent loses, or the agent team leader wins and the ISA loses. And there's that, that balance, which, um, and, and I think that this is the key point too, of, you know, being able to have someone like you, uh, like a mentor to go to, because look, dude, like I get asked this question all the time of, of, Hey man, what, what should my, what should my splits be? What are the splits on your team? I'm like, I'll tell anybody <laughs> what the splits are on my team, but there is a difference. You know, right? Yeah. How we operate, what we do. I charge a transaction fee in addition to the commission that comes back to me. We, I don't have fancy offices. Like we, we, we operate very thin and we operate very high volume, you know, right? Yeah. So um, I can charge a way lesser split than other teams, you know, right? Per se, or somebody else that operates differently. So, you know, there, there's so many variables where it's almost like to do it's it so right, good. you almost have to have somebody that can look at your whole entire business and help you craft. Yeah. You know, I, I have a client here locally. They're a top listing team. And uh, surprisingly, I don't know if this is just a function of them having been around as long as they have, but literally they don't offer any support to their team members. Their team members are on the team and they're paying them 50 or maybe 60% um, at, the, at the most, but they don't, no admin support, right? And not, not anything guaranteed, which is crazy. Like that's unheard of, of any sort of, uh, you know, recent teams or modern teams, right? Modern teams like throw everything at, at the agents. Uh, so that's something that, yeah, it's definitely a unique individual plan based on your personal business and the way you're running things. Yeah. Love it, man. So then, um, you know, real quick, cause I, I, I know we're, we're already going long and I, I've got, unfortunately I've got a hard stop in about 15 minutes. So, um, sure. so I want to make sure we talk about this cause I think that this is you not, know, I'm, I'm a, um, such a big believer. Like when I have a problem or a pain or an obstacle or anything new that I'm doing, right? Well, like once I decide I, I want to uh, do this path or do this thing, whatever, my first question is who is the best person that I can go to, to help me implement this? Um, um, cause it's about time, man. It's about time and money. And yeah. you know, so many people get so focused on the, you know, 10 grand, they got to pay for an investment or, or, or whatever, but I'm like, yeah, you're not focused on the, the million you're going to lose if you don't get that train right. plus the time that it condenses. And like, I don't try to do anything alone. Right. It's like this self-made is, is there's no such thing as self-made, right? Like, you know, <laughs> not you get very the right far. Mentors, you get the right mentors, you get the right information, whether it's, you know, a mentor of an agent that's already doing it that you can go shadow from and that can teach you and, and, and really be involved or you hire the right coach. And, and, um, you know, I always, I mean, for the last decade, I had multiple coaches at any given time and one of the six figures here that I invest in it because I believe it so much. And, um, with you be I mean, obviously proving this, this is what you do. Um, um, and now, you know, not only did you do it as a team, but now you've broken away and, and started your own coaching company where you can, you know, help agents all over, uh, go out there and create this and do this and what you specialize in, which I also love too. You're not trying to be the coach of, you're not trying to be the coach of everything. It's like, Hey, we're going to go to the one niche that we're the best at that are proven. And we're going to coach agents on this one thing. Um, yeah. uh, with that being said, man, like, where do people learn more about you? What do they learn about your coaching services? How do they get a hold of you? Uh, um, um, you know, to discuss more of, of getting that support for their ISA training. I'm super easy to find. It's smartinsidesales.com or they can just email me, dale at smartinsidesales.com. And on our website, we've got a couple of free uh, training webinars. Uh, one is directly created for agents and ISAs, which is how to convert leads into cash, how to, how to really convert at a high level. And then the other one is how to hire, train, and lead rock star ISAs. So that would be for your team leaders, uh, you know, brokerage owners, things like that. But we have those two free training courses that are on there right there. And, you know, honestly, we, we do have, obviously we coach and we have training courses that we sell, uh, but what we're teaching in those webinars are pieces of those training courses that we're just giving away for free. So people can check that out there. Yeah. I mean, they, they're going to learn something, they get, they get value and, and all that for free, but they also get a good taste of, of what it would be like, you know, to work with you. And from when you're yeah. working with you, it's, it's a thousand X time, you know, times a thousand on steroids from that, but at least they get a taste, which I love that man. Um, yeah. Which is a good segue into, you know, my, my next question I wanted to ask you of, um, um, so you, because you, you, it sounds like you offer um, ISA training and coaching as well as yes. agent coaching and training. Yeah, right. Because like I'll get asked in like my coaching program of a, oh, hey, Josh, do you, do you have specific training um, um, uh, for admin that like my new assistant can watch? You know, right. And, and or the ISA training. Right. And I'm, I'm like, no, you know, right. Like I've got very detailed training on how to hire an admin, whatever, or same thing with the ISA. But, you know, outside of that, I'm like, look, when I hire an admin, they are going to do exactly what I did, how I want it done, right? Uh, uh, to go out there and deliver the highest level service to, to my buyer and seller clients. 
they're just doing it instead of me. Right. Yeah. So, so now I can focus on more money making activities. Same thing with my ISAs, right? It's like my ISAs are going to follow my proven follow, uh, uh, follow protocol to ET, you know, right? To go out there and, and get the most success. So they're going to do that follow protocol. It just allows me to go out there and now I can spend my time recruiting agents where instead of like all that same effort that, that gets me one appointment or one closing with a buyer seller, now I can, I can use my time better as a team leader to recruit an agent that might bring in 50 deals. Yeah, right? So, yeah. Um, um, you know, so really everything you're coaching and teaching ISAs is going to be things that is just going to help any agent in their business because yes. you have an ISA or you're playing, you, you got to play the role of an ISA in your company, right? That's the only yeah. thing, right? So well, what, I, what I did was I took everything that we did, everything that we know and developed about recruiting, uh, hiring, training, leading, managing uh, ISAs, and I packaged that up into one course called the ISA department in a box. But here's what I didn't add at that time is I left, I told people how to train their ISA and gave them kind of a structure, but I didn't have the ISA training. And then what I discovered is as I was, uh, actually I was contract, our team was, our company was contracted by another coaching company to come and provide role play calls, call review sessions and lead conversion training for their people because they didn't have it at a high level. Because again, that, uh, Com coaching company owner didn't actually have the experience of doing it. So they didn't have that. So I came in and actually had to develop uh, on a large scale, all of that training course material for what's a lead. How do you talk to a lead? How do you, how should, what's the best practices for working your CRM regardless of what the CRM is, right? How do you objection handle to a, a better level than all the garbage scripts that you can download on the internet, right? How do you have a real conversation with somebody, understand what they want, get inside their head, and then show them that you're the best representation of that thing they want. Uh, and then how do you close them to a high level, right? So we packaged all that up and that's called Conversion University, which I then realized was, hey, this is not just ISA training. Any agents who want to take their lead conversion, their conversations to the next level can use that, that system. Uh, so that, that's what we developed there. So we have the two training courses. It's, do you want to hire and train and manage an ISA or do you want really high level lead conversion training. And that's, those are the two things that we have. So that's when you ask about training an ISA, I don't teach them how to function in your team, right? I don't teach them how to do things exactly the way you want them done. But what I do teach them is here's best practices on not losing your leads in your CRM. Here's my recommended touch schedule for those things. Here's my, you know, these are the really high level conversational skills that you can use, whether it's a lead or it's your six year old who won't put her shoes on so you can get out the door. Right. That's what we teach. Yeah. Love it, man. So we're in 2019, you know, the average consumer is what sold two, three times commercially a day. It, it, it just, <laughs> yeah. I, I was on, uh, I uh, had my buddy, uh, uh, Pat Hyven who, uh, you know, yeah, Pat. Podcast. I, I had him on, uh, uh, I don't know, it was probably two years ago on the podcast and we were jamming for a while. And, and he's like, man, he goes, you know, back, back in like the nineties, when you got a lead, he's like, he's like, it's almost like snorting a line of Coke where he's like, man, like you, like you knew you were going to convert it. You're in, you got money. I, yeah. Right. Um, um, and not that he does or did Coke, he just uses an analogy, but, um, um, uh, but with that, dude, like today, man, it takes so much frequency. It takes so much more. Everybody's being sold and, and do that. Like, we're just not wired as it, our brains aren't wired to be able to handle it. So the walls and the blocks are up. So in 2019, right now, if you were to give either, you know, your two top maybe uh, pieces of advice for agents to either make sure that they're doing that would have the biggest impact on, on following up with these leads, confirming two appointments, or the top two things, you know, to maybe avoid could be the one, what would those look like right now? Uh, this is something I was just training on today, right? And we teach get everybody's who, where, when, why, what, and how much every single time that you talk to them, right? The, I mean, the first time that you talk to them, every person you talk to, you're going to get all of that information from them and really focusing on the why and who they are and what this means to them. And here's why. So when you have a brand new lead, somebody who's not necessarily referred to you, who isn't warm, who doesn't already think they're going to work with you anyway, right? When you get some, first of all, nobody wants to talk to a salesperson. Josh, when, how often do you go out and you're like, hey, as a consumer, you're like, I really want to talk to a salesperson about buying a car or buying some shoes or anything else, right? Unless you really need help. You don't want to talk to a salesperson, right? Yeah, 
Nobody does, right? So just accept that. And here's what happens. People have this wall up, right? Your leads are going to have this wall up. And as you're talking to them, if you can get them to answer your questions about their who, when, where, why, what, and how much, and really, you know, divulge to you who they are and what they're doing and why they're doing it and what it means to them, that wall comes down at that point. They've stepped over that wall. They've told all that story to a salesperson, but guess what happens? The next time that they get confronted by a salesperson, that wall comes back up. Now, they've already exposed themselves to a salesperson. They've already told their story once exhaustively, right? Who likes to repeat themselves? Nobody. So if you get all of that information from somebody, they're going to be, far, they're going to, one, they're going to feel some more rapport with you. They're going to feel a connection. And two, they're going to be less likely to give that whole story to another Tom, Dick, or Harry salesperson that comes along after you, right? So that's really what's huge. And I know that it sounds like I'm just simply repeating uh, something that we all already know, right? Ask great questions, get everything out of them. Here's what we do in, in, our, in our coaching practice and in our training is we actually listen to salespeople's calls and we play them and we coach to them. And guess what? They don't do it. They say, oh yeah, I know that. I'm supposed to ask questions. They don't do it, right? You play it for them. They'll be embarrassed, right? And they're like, oh yeah, all I know is her name is Pat and she was calling about 123 Main Street and we're supposed to meet tomorrow. That's all I know, right? That's what happens most of the time. So believe me, if you think, oh yeah, I know this, go listen to some of your calls. I guarantee you that you're, there's just a lot more information you're not getting from people. So if you get that information, if you really get that information, they're going to be, they're going to cut off other people faster. They're going to feel more rapport. And here's the other thing. When somebody feels rapport with a salesperson, do you think they want to go find another salesperson? Another stranger, they don't. They didn't want to find one in the first place, but guess what? You're the lost puppy that just came home with them, and they're keeping you. That's what happens. Yeah, no, love it, man. It's such powerful stuff. And I think if we get out of think of ourselves as a real estate agent, but put ourselves like you just talked about of and that, like how we consume, like us wearing our like our consumer hat of like, hey man, like when you go, when you're shopping for a car, you're, you're just, when you walk in the mall, whatever, how you want to be treated and like your own behaviors, like we, you know, can all discover that we're wired that same way, right? So yeah, I love it, man. Um, all right, you guys, those that are watching and listening, I know I end every podcast with this, but information without implementation is truly the start of the illusion. Information isn't power. It's taking that information, taking massive action on it that allows you to uh, go out there and create the, the, the life that you know you want and deserve. Um, and Dale shared so many amazing pieces of advice with you guys today. Make sure that you, you take something that you learn here and take massive action on it. Right below, we're going to have uh, 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 Dale's uh, uh, link, uh, which is smartinsidesales.com. Right? Go on there, check it out. Nothing else, man. He's got a bunch of free content on there that you can learn from, <laughs> grow from. So worst case scenario, you learn some cool shit that you can go out there and grow from. So go check that out right now. Um, and Dale, man, I truly appreciate you taking time out of your day to be here. It's been awesome, hey, brother. Thank you. It's an honor. Listen, you're a legend, man. You're like one of the original the OG podcasters. <laughs> this is an honor. That truly means a lot, my friend. All right, you guys. Well, thank you so much for watching and listening, and we will see you next time.